the continuation on the inside path comes from seeing the dissolving of everything. Now, I mentioned yesterday already that that was a very important point in the insight, uh, on the insight path, that having experienced a rising and ceasing of whatever there is in oneself to the point of seeing it momentarily, now, this moment, that brings about the experience of just watching how everything is dissolving. Now this momentary experience of arising and ceasing means that we can actually feel ourselves to be that way. And when we feel ourselves to be constantly in movement, one of the things that happen is one doesn't take oneself so seriously anymore. It isn't all that important. It's all just going by anyway. This all-fired importance that we have about ourselves is such a strong um, difficulty, such an enormous difficulty because we can't see beyond it. If that's all there is, that we are so important, then how about everything else? Doesn't seem so important then, does it? It's, everything is always reckoned in terms of how does it affect me? So me is always the center of attention. And not this person, but me. The idea of me is a center of attention. The more that goes like that, the more difficult life becomes. So the arising and ceasing is not just only the way to Nibbana, which of course it is, but it is also and a, a very important aspect of getting things into a proper perspective. The proper perspective about life, the world, oneself and others is a balance. That we're balancing looking after ourselves, certainly, we have to. But what about everything else? Is that just peripheral? seen with peripheral vision, or is it really in focus? Arising and ceasing is the one thing that will put it into focus. Without that, real understanding of that, which then becomes the experience, the insight path won't go any further. So as we see that in in everything, in thought, in feeling, in sense contact, in uh, body, in everything around us, and see it m from moment to moment, our mind will automatically go towards the dissolution, how everything falls away, keeps moving away from us. And now that is the the dissolution can give rise to a feeling of terror or panic. We mentioned that already yesterday, and it is, it can be considered to be a separate step on the inside, or it can be part of the next step, which, which is disenchantment. It depends which way one wants to look at it. A jhana meditator is not likely to have much or any terror or panic because the mind is cushioned against that. The jhanas are not just 
a pleasant abiding. They change the mind. And that's what we're after, isn't it? Because the mind we had until now wasn't really bringing happiness, was it? So changing one's mind is the easiest way to do that, is through the jhanas. So also this particular point in the inside path, the terror or the panic which arises, is not likely to be of any real consequence for a jhana meditator. For a non-jhana meditator that gets to the dissolution, it is a point which needs to be considered. There is another point in that also, that somebody who hasn't got the concentration for jhanas is not that likely to come to as far as this, because you need concentration for all this. So to see that everything is momentarily from moment to moment falling apart is usually done with a very concentrated mind. Now there's always exceptions. These are generalities. The, uh, but the terror, the, the, the panic which arises even for a jhana meditator is the fact that at this point it's possible to have an experience of whatever, what have I been doing all my life? I've tackled it all wrong. This looks entirely different from what I thought it was. And that's not so much terror and panic, it's more a bit of a disappointment or a feeling of, uh, for heaven's sakes, why didn't I know this 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 30 years ago, whatever one's age happens to be. So it can be more like that. But if one comes to that stage of where one really sees all this dissolving in from moment to moment and doesn't do any jhanas and is still has enough concentration to experience this, not think it. Thinking it is one thing, but experiencing is another. And the experience actually is quite um, uh, remarkable because the whole compactness of this body, the whole solidity of mind and body has no reality at that time. It feels as if there are just constant impulses, no, not even that. It feels as if there is some, some movement, yes, constant movement, but this movement is not, even, is not even felt as if it ever comes together to be a whole body and a whole mind, because it's so quick. So this is a very important step. Now, the person who doesn't have the jhanas and actually becomes aware of this may become frightened. It's quite... Uh, in the cards because the mind doesn't have any recourse to anything. The, uh, although the mind has slowly worked up to that understanding, it doesn't have anything that it can now rely on. It sees everything that it has always relied on falling apart. It has been relying on its own intelligence, it has been relying on this body to look after, this person, because it can, you know, do things, it has been relying on its uh, knowledge, on its uh, charm, on its beauty, on its wealth, on its, uh, who knows what we're all relying on, on its job, on, uh, on its family, everything, whatever we've been relying on, particularly on oneself, of course. And we see this self, this so-called self, being nothing but a, a movement. At that time it's seen as a movement. So that's a bit of a panic can be arising there because what am I going to rely on? And at that time, it's if that does arise, it's... Um, 
if the mind can see this clearly, the mind will know that what it actually means is that there's nothing that's desirable to be found anywhere because everything is falling apart. And at that moment, the mind can be content with that insight. See, the first step of, of fear arising is a discontent. This is not the way I want it. This isn't the way I had figured it out. I had figured it out entirely different. In fact, most people figure out if everybody's going to be nice to me, I'll be fine. That's what most people think. I mean, it's very primitive, but that's what most people think. And since nobody ever gets it that way, we're never fine. But at that moment, it's a totally different view. We see that nothing can be relied upon. It's all falling to bits. And that moment, the reality of Dukkha is seen. Because I have said this before, but I must say this again, Dukkha does not mean pain, grief, and lamentation, suffering, tragedy, birth, decay, and death. It means all that. But it means unsatisfactoriness. That's the meaning of Dukkha. And that's what one sees quite clearly at that moment. It's all falling apart, so how can it be satisfactory? And at that time, the mind is also ready to see the danger in looking for satisfaction in the worldly conditions. Now, we do get certain satisfactions. I mean, people sometimes do tell us that we are very clever and very nice and very pretty and all the rest of it. And sometimes we actually do have success with one thing or another. But it's uh, usually short-lived. And so when we... The, the other times, there's always dissatisfaction. Now, dissatisfaction does not mean that there is a certain external cause for dissatisfaction. It's nobody's fault. There's nobody in this world that has promised to satisfy us, whether human or otherwise. There is nobody at all. Dissatisfaction is a human condition. And dissatisfaction, to see it, on a spiritual level, means we've gained insight. But if we're dissatisfied, we've seen it on a worldly level, and it doesn't do a slightest bit of good. Because being dissatisfied is very simple. Every kid can do it. From the day they're born until they're out of the house, you hear nothing but dissatisfaction. They're screaming and, and crying. and <laughs> I mean, anybody can do it at any age to be dissatisfied. And of course, we can do it too. We can be dissatisfied with anything, with the other people, with the weather, with the food, with the uh, meditation, with the teacher, with the Buddha, with anything. It doesn't matter what it is. We can dream up anything. Our minds are so fertile, we can dream up anything. So that doesn't help us to be dissatisfied. But to see that dissatisfaction is one of the three characteristics of the whole of human existence and unsatisfactoriness, one of the three characteristics of the whole universe, that's insight. So there's an enormous difference between reacting to those things and then having all this sort of unhappiness within or seeing it. One is just reaction, the worldly way, and the other is insight. And when we gain the insight in the unsatisfactoriness of all conditions, we've got, at this point, we have a very deep understanding. Because that will not take us away from the past, but bring it us right on it. Because the next thing that we will see, 
is the danger that exists in all formations. The danger which exists in everything that we can put our mind on. The danger that exists is because it always pushes us somewhere, either to wanting to have it or wanting to get rid of it, no matter whether it is something gross and material or whether it's something subtle and spiritual. We want to get it or do we want to get rid of it. We want to get jhanas, we want to get enlightenment, we want to get rid of defilements, whatever it is. It's oppressive. It's like having somebody with a whip standing behind one and constantly hitting one. And we're doing it ourselves. We are the one with the whip and we're also the one that's being hit. So when we see that, then the urgency arises. The urgency that we want to get out. Now with that, we have probably a feeling within that our pathway is actually, we are, we are actually moving along. The urgency brings us to that feeling of moving along the spiritual path. We don't get bogged down on it. Here's one uh, paragraph which is useful to read out. It's when we receive the danger, when we have seen danger and dissolution. Whenever a meditator finds that the knowledge of this dissolution, that's all, everything falling apart, has arisen within him, should make it a point to stick to his meditation seat, even if it means foregoing meals and refreshments, should continue to sit motionless, allowing the cycle of insight knowledges to turn full circle. Those of keen insight pass through these stages very rapidly. So one shouldn't eat. Huh? <laughs> well, what it means is that the urgency should be felt, that one should feel the urgency. Now I'm seeing. And you see this seeing, it's very interesting also. What can I compare it to? You know these things that children play with where there is a picture uh, that is drawn in a, in a picture book and then there is a face of a cow hidden in the branch and if you look at it from the certain angle you can see the cow quite clearly and then you put your head up like this and the cow's disappeared and then you look again and there's the cow this is the way it, uh, it happens when real insight arises first it is yeah right I see that and then you look back again and say everything looks the same as before and then you look at that inside again and everything has changed. And eventually you get used to that change. And that's the only thing you see. It's all falling apart. Nothing is satisfied. But you'd never become dissatisfied. On the contrary, you become very happy about it because you realize you've seen the truth. Everybody is intelligent enough to know when they've seen the truth. Having seen the truth of dissatisfaction everywhere you go is a feeling of happiness. When, this, when you're feeling dissatisfied, then one hasn't seen it. When one still thinks that one has a special deal, it's me, special. Or somebody did something specially bad, so that's why I'm now feeling so bad. Now these two the uh, the um, uh, terror, the danger, and the urgency, actually, those three together, they all bring with it the real next stage of insight, which is disenchantment, nibida. And with disenchantment, the super mundane path starts. We haven't really experience the super mundane yet 
but we don't go back. Having seen that, we are firmly on it. The um, The danger brings with it from the dissolution, the impermanence, and with the dissatisfaction, the dukkha. And having seen all that, the disenchantment with whatever is possible to do in the world, whatever it may be, it means that we can see quite clearly that even the most pleasant state is not going to satisfy us fully. The, we may have, well, let's say, all eight jhanas, and yet the mind which is finely tuned to the experiences knows there's got to be something else. This can't be all. They too are impermanent. Now obviously we can't walk around or live our lives in the eight jhanas. We've got to live our lives in a very ordinary consciousness. And what we try to do in our daily lives is to relieve the tedium of this ordinary consciousness with pleasant sense contact. And as long as we believe that these pleasant sense contacts are going to do it for us, and as long as we're reacting to them, we don't have any disenchantment. But when we see that what we're doing, when we're watching ourselves and recognizing the fact that although we have the pleasant sense contact, it has no satisfaction in it at all. And this is the interesting part of it. Because until then, we, had, we always thought that the pleasant sense contact, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling and thinking, which of that which is pleasant and having that, gave us happiness. And now, all we see is the sense contact and a pleasant feeling arising which no longer satisfies. And that's the disenchantment. So even eating one's favorite food or seeing one's favorite movie or hearing one's favorite music, pleasant feeling arises, but it doesn't satisfy. There's no satisfaction at all. The mind has become finely tuned to all that is happening within, because by that time, by that time as far as we got here, the mind has been mindful enough, long enough, investigating enough, long enough, so that it knows exactly what's happening within. And it can tell quite clearly that pleasant feeling coming and going, coming and going, no satisfaction. And because of this no satisfaction with their pleasant feelings, the search for the pleasant contacts stops. There's no search for it at all. One doesn't search for them at all. They do arise and disappear as they've always done. And one knows exactly that they have arisen and have disappeared again. The search has stopped. And with that stopping of the search for the pleasant co sense contacts, the world no longer seems the place where we're going to find our happiness. We have seen through it that the world is nothing but a phenomena which we use for our livelihood because we have a body, so we have to use the world to live in it, but we no longer use it as our playground. It's not 
necessary any longer. It's there, we keep the body in it alive, but we have given up the idea that it is a playground which will provide happiness for us. Which means that equanimity can arise. We don't have to react. Neither do we have to react with great glee about anything that seems good to us, nor do we have to react with depression to anything that seems bad for us. The world hasn't got it. It cannot satisfy. Now, we don't need to do that on an intellectual basis. We can, of course. It's quite helpful if one does it on an intellectual basis in order to get a grip on the whole thing. But meaningful, it is only when we feel it. And therefore, the whole <clears throat> pathway is, of course, one of feeling. But since in order to give the guidelines, one has to use the words, it appears as if it were a path of intellectual deliberation. It's nothing like that at all. But it's the only way I can communicate on that level. I cannot give you the feeling that you're going to have to arouse yourself. The intellectual deliberation is nothing but a signpost pointing in the right direction. And if you want to get out of Dukkha, that's the direction you can take, if you like. And as you take that direction and examine through your own experience, all these factors, the feeling will arise. And the feeling of disenchantment with the world is one of great impact, enormous peacefulness. One doesn't have to achieve anything. One doesn't have to comply with anything. Of course, one behaves uh, as, as society uh, expects, but there's nothing there. I don't know if you can remember when, we were teen when you were teenagers. I can remember that a long time ago. That it seemed to be a shame if you didn't have a date on Saturday. Right? And preferably Saturday and Sunday, date on both days. I mean, it was a real oppression. You had to have it. It's the same now. You have to have it. You have to have certain things in this world. It doesn't have to be dates, but it's got to be something, whatever it is, so that you can hold up your head and say, yes, I've got all this, and I'm doing all this, and I can do all this. When the world is no longer considered to be your playground, and you no longer think that the world's got it, all that oppression goes. Everything is just, just moving along, that's all. Constantly changing, coming and going. That's all it's doing. A constant movement. Now, if one doesn't see that constant movement, one cannot come to that equanimity. One has to see the constant movement. And isn't it simple to see? Everything we are moves. The breath moves. The heart moves. The thought moves. The legs move. A feeling comes, a feeling goes. The day comes, the day goes. The night comes, the night goes. Isn't it simple? Everything comes, everything goes. And the more we put it pinpointedly on one moment, the more it disappears. It's all falling apart. Every breath goes. If one doesn't see that, then the disenchantment cannot arise because we still hope that, we still are full of hope that it's, we're going to make it out there. There's nothing to make out there. 
it hasn't got anything to make it with. It's all coming and going. And that kind of pressure that we put on ourselves, nobody does it, we only put it on ourselves, that we have to be a certain way and we have to understand a certain way and we have to live a certain way and we have to relate a certain way and we have to connect a certain way. It's all pressure. We're putting it all on ourselves. What certain way? It's all coming and going constantly. The movement which is in the whole of the universe, it can be felt in one's own mind and body. So when we do these different methods which I've talked about and do these uh, inquiries, we eventually will feel it. And only when we feel it will we not feel what we used to feel. And that's what it's all about. We get away from that what we used to feel and we feel something new. And as we feel something new, the world's not disgusting, it just is. The world's not wonderful, it just is. In constant movement, that's all. And we are not wonderful and we are not awful, we just are. In constant movement, always changing. And the whole thing has the connotation of transparency. That's another thing that we become aware of when we see the dissolution. It's not that we can look through somebody and see the ribs or anything like that, but we feel as if there was a certain transparency about it all, that this whole business of being such a solid entity has completely gone, so that even out there, it's all moving. It's not solid. It's growing and decaying. When one has um, come to this disenchantment, um, sometimes people become disenchanted also with their meditation practice. That's also an interesting uh, stage because the mind might say, well, if there's nothing worthwhile, so what am I doing this for? Um, naturally, the mind will, event will eventually know that in order to get out of the dissatisfaction of the world, one has to continue with one's practice. But there can be that moment or moments, several moments, where the mind says, well, if nothing is worth anything, so why should I do this? If nothing is worth anything. Which is, of course, an unbalanced state, because it's extreme. It's extreme in rel denying the value of the spiritual path. Whereas, usually, we are on the other side. We are extreme on affirming the beauty and worth, worth and value of the material world. So we need to find the middle way. The world is, and we need it because we've got a body, and it's got to live in it, that body. But it's never going to be totally satisfying. It's got its moments, but it's never going to be total sa totally satisfying. And the spiritual path, this practice, will bring us to that moment of seeing absolute truth and seeing absolute truth for ourselves, we can eventually be completely satisfied. But then, of course, the me isn't satisfied. It's just satisfaction. Also at this stage, sometimes um, people not only feel dissatisfied with the um, practice or disenchanted with the practice, but with all their companions, with everything that is going on. And being in that state of mind, the, uh, the practice, of course, gets stopped. So it's very important to not only be able to re-arouse wisdom 
faith, energy, mindfulness, and concentration, the five spiritual faculties, but also to have that kind of understanding that enlightenment is still quite a ways off, so there's more practice necessary. But this enchantment can have very strong impact, positively and negatively. So we need to see it in the middle. What arises together with, or as a, as a, a result of, I should say, as a result of this uh, disenchantment, if it is seen properly, that the world's got nothing to offer, is a strong desire to be delivered of the world. It's called desire for deliverance. And that is next, the next insight. From the disenchantment, it goes to the desire for deliverance. The mind says, this is all I want to do. I want to get out. Because I can never find completeness, fulfillment. I can never find an absence of dukkha. And again, dukkha doesn't mean suffering. It means unsatisfactoriness. There's always something. If it isn't this, then there's something else. If it isn't something that we can change ourselves, then we hope that somebody else will change it, and then after it's been changed, it's also no good, and then we have to change it again. As some always something. We can never be in one spot, totally satisfied, without any changes, having complete fulfillment within, without it dissolving. So then we know deliverance is possible or freedom because the Buddha said there's only one thing I teach and that's dukkha and its end to reach that's all he taught it wasn't just a meditation path wasn't just an inside path it was a path to get out of all dukkha there's only one thing I teach and that's dukkha and its end to reach. Because of his compassion, when he reached the end of dukkha, he saw that some people could be helped to reach the end of dukkha too. But in order to want to reach the end of dukkha, we've got to see it properly. Huh? That's why the inquiry into anicca dukkha anatta whichever one we like, has to be done with great skill and energy so that we actually can see it in a moment-to-moment -moment arising and ceasing that there is this dissolving of everything which means unsatisfactoriness. So if we want to, to, want to reach Dukkha, we have to, we have to know it. Desire for deliverance has some peculiarities in it on a practical part, uh, standpoint. Very often, when that has come about, one constantly sees one's own shortcomings and there's a lack of self-confidence. Now that is not so strong in a jhana meditator because the second jhana brings self-confidence. But it's still is there that because one hasn't really come to the end of anything there is a lack of confidence there's a re reflection upon one's own shortcomings and there's also great restlessness because of the fact that one really wants to get out the mind sometimes becomes very restless and it can't settle down to any of the meditative um, methods. It just can't make up its mind at all what to do. It tries one thing and it tries another, and it's very restless. 
at that at that time also one wants to change things one wants to change the room around one wants to change the kitchen around one wants to change one's uh, sitting posture one wants to change one's the meditation method one wants to change one's um, companions one wants to change one's teacher one wants to change everything around because everything is so unsatisfactory but that has to be seen quite clearly as just a state which also dissolves constantly dissolving um, only a mind which is an ob- objective observer of itself will be able to continue on this path we have to observe what we're doing if we don't observe it then we will believe it and if we believe it we get stuck because if we believe all these negativities or these hindrances obstacles and defilements or we'll get stuck in the moon wave there's nothing there that is believable everything arises and ceases constantly now even if the mind resurrects all its miseries over and over again that doesn't mean they haven't arisen and ceased in the meanwhile they have they're constantly coming and going the mind just brings it all up again over and over one misery after another was the same one over and over but that doesn't mean it's not dissolving everything's dissolving only when we have seen that is it a possibility of sitting with it and saying that too is impermanent whatever it may be it's all falling apart constantly but it has to be seen moment to moment in each moment how it falls apart in each moment not over a long span like the universe falling apart or maybe like oneself dying or maybe like the whole day disappearing that's not good enough It's got to be seen in every moment how everything comes together and falls apart and that's such a relief because who wants to hang on to all the miseries to all the dukkha people want to hang on one wonders why and if one looks at it with a little bit of humor and a little bit of objectivity one can start really smiling about oneself and that means that one has become a little bit more objective if we can see our own absurdities with a smile then we have seen ourselves a little more correctly we also need determination there are 10 virtues which we need to develop and which anyone who wants to be delivered of dukkha needs to develop on this path in order to have the necessary strength of character to carry on this is not this path is not for people with weak will power or with a weak character this is only for strong minded people one of them is determination determination is the same as will power if we don't have that determination to get ourselves out of this unsatisfactory state that every deluded person is in and which we must have seen by that time that that is not satisfactory the set determination isn't there we can easily fall into the error of being depressed by it all well being depressed by it all is the same kind of error on the other side of the extreme as being delighted by it all it's such a wonderful world 
everything's all right with the best of all worlds. I said, really? Forty-six wars. No, sorry, sorry, eighty-six wars. Eighty-six wars since 1945. Everything's all right with the best of all worlds. Nonsense, huh? Well, the opposite is equal nonsense. That one can, be, that there's any reason to be depressed by it. Because all of it is just a passing show. Constantly moving. Always changing. Never having any absolute truth in it. Never any absolute reality. Nothing. Just... Anyone with even some concentration doesn't have to be perfect concentration can see that constant movement. Anyone can. And if we don't then have a resolve from that, if we don't use that seeing of the constant movement for our own insight, then we haven't seen it properly. So we have to look again. The knowledge, uh, the sorry, the desire for deliverance needs to be seen when we uh, become dissatisfied with everything that it may last a little while or longer we need to use determination Uh, the kind of mind which has willpower in it is not a mind that will overpower willpower just means that we use our strengths of mind in one direction and hopefully in the right direction now with that desire for deliverance which contains terror, danger and urgency uh, the um, disenchantment which contains terror, danger and urgency and the desire for deliverance comes as an adjunct to this desire for deliverance reflection and what we do at that time is reflect and review any of the insights that we may have had by then in other words we again check up on anicca dukkha anatta whether we can see it in ourselves and everything around us now we can use one of them or all three all, every one of them has a different doorway through which we can go in order to see absolute truth Anicca has a doorway which is called the doorway of signlessness. Dukkha, wishlessness, anatta, void. Signlessness. It means that we, if you look at the arising and ceasing again and again, we will see that nothing ever stays long enough to have a mode of existence which is solid which can be used for hanging on to it for attachment and which has ultimate significance 
Now, obviously, for a jhana meditator, this is greatly facilitated because one sees exactly that in the seventh jhana. But having seen it in the seventh jhana, we also have to refer to it and understand the experience. It's no use just having the seventh jhana, we have to understand the experience. So whether we have it or not, the the experience of the constant arising and ceasing of everything, constant movement, and it's so fast, we can hardly keep up with it by when watching it, brings about that understanding that within that impermanence nothing can be grasped, held on to, kept, made significant. Wonderful feeling of ease, wonderful feeling of lack of burden. What is there that can oppress us? It's all moving. Now with Dukkha, we probably by this time have already noticed that whenever we want something, we've got Dukkha. That the only time that we haven't got it, are not aware of it, got it, we haven't got aware of it, is when we're not wanting anything. Which is particularly strong in the third jhana because that is a time when the mind is quite contented, experiences contentment, and therefore no dukkha. Having known that in the third jhana, we realize we can make the connection. If we can't make the connections, we can't really see the thing. We can make the connection that because in the third jhana there's wishlessness, there is contentment. When there is wishlessness, there is no dukkha, there is contentment. So know the the pathway. When we come to absolute truth through the understanding of dukkha, means that we understand and actually practice being without wishes. Seeing things as they are, accepting them as they are, and being with them as they are, not trying to have it different. That constant wish to have it different is the constant irritation. That's real dukkha. The more we want things to be different from what they are, the more dukkha we've got. Whether we do it on purpose, deliberately, wanting, wishing, or whether it's just a mental formation which arises <coughs> and ceases, of course, doesn't make any difference. The more we want things different from the way they are, the more dukkha we've got. And checking up on anatta, that, of course, takes more of an insight into the reality of the lack of substance, which should have been something we could see in the elements, which we could see in the um, constant movement, Because whatever moves all the time cannot possibly have a core substance. And the word void means just that. It means no core substance. So anatta does not only show us that there is no real self to be found, but it shows us that there is no core substance. Now this desire for deliverance carries with it the dissatisfaction which we need to overcome and carries with it the renewed reflection 
and this time the reflection on the three characteristics with one of their doorways. If we can't see the constant movement of everything, we won't see the constant dukkha. And if we can't see the constant dukkha, we won't see the anatta either. Somewhere along the line, we've got to see what it really is. Often, the mind resists. For no reason that one can perceive, It just resists because it's too full of other things. Well, we try again another time. If the mind is open, it can see it clearly. Nothing remains. All is gone. Whatever we have ever experienced, known, felt, thought, seen, heard, tasted, touched, all gone and it was gone the moment it arose the dissolution of everything that that arises is so fast that we can hardly keep pace with it it's so quick maybe that's enough for tonight if you have any questions this is a time to ask them you should ask questions as you know it's a sign of intelligence not a sign of stupidity (laughs) yes Um, so let me see if I got the steps correct starting with arising and ceasing then comes dissolution right and then the dissolution is Unsatisfactoriness? Well, sometimes the terror, huh? And the terror. First the terror and then the danger. And then Every, everything is unsatisfactory, yes. Right, so those, the terror, the danger, and the unsatisfactoriness come basically together. And then disenchantment, and then the desire for deliverance. Does the terror abate with the disenchantment? Oh yes, the, the terror is uh, for jhana meditators doesn't exist. Where does the, the dissatisfaction disappear or does it form? When we see that the, that comes in the desire for deliverance, that's when the person is very dissatisfied. Um, the desire for deliverance with this dissatisfaction that's in there I'm not satisfied with what there is because I've seen that I've got to get out of it right that comes through that next step the reflection on Anicca Dukkanata disappears because you can't have your mind on both things you can either have it on being dissatisfied or you can have it on Anicca Dukkanata so basically the reflection that comes from the desire for deliverance counteracts the dissatisfaction yeah and then the final point is like, how do you get into the third jhana if you're dissatisfied? Well, through the second, because the joy that arises in the second, right, mm-hmm. that is then a moment of wishlessness, because this is what everybody wants, they want to be happy, right? right? So you've got it. So what, what else is there to wish for? Okay, so the... quite how to say it. it. It seems like the dissatisfaction is all pervading except for the jhanas. That's right. The dissatisfaction in the jhanas comes about at the moment when they're finished. So actually being that absorbed blocks dissatisfaction from... And that's why it's also no terror. Right. Why we don't get any terror from seeing this dissolution. But at the moment when the jhanas are finished then dissatisfaction it's also not the end what is there right. but first you've got to have them in order to be dissatisfied with them right <laughs> then ultimately the jhanas don't exist either then 
I mean, they were kind of a mind moment, just like everything else. Sure. At that point, there's everything a mind there, moment. There were a fiction too, or you know what I mean, ultimately. A fiction? Well, that mean, word does not apply. Well, okay, but I mean that they were, they were on the path, but then they don't exist in the end. There's this anatta. So no, uh-uh, 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 no. <laughs> they are not ultimate reality, okay. but they certainly are mind moments. The, uh, the everything that comes also goes. But fiction? No, fiction is fantasy. That's, that doesn't apply. The, uh, if you give them ultimate reality, that's a fiction, yes. Okay. But so they, are, I, they themselves are not fiction. Okay. On, the, on the mundane plane, they're reality-like. Okay. But not ultimate. Okay, anything else? Yes. When you say in the world that everything, that dukkha is pervasive, you're still acknowledging that in the world there's both pleasure and pain, of course. But the dukkha... Well, pain is dukkha anyway. Yeah, but the... But isn't that sort of different? Like, like I'm talking about... I guess what I'm talking about is... Uh, the presence of both painful, um, what's the, I'm sorry, I don't know this framework very well. The, um, when you, the first sense, the sense contact? Yeah. Okay. There's pleasurable sense contacts in the world. And uh, painful and pleasurable feelings. Painful and pleasurable feelings. Okay. But the dukkha is something else. The dukkha is in our relationship to that pleasure and pain. That yes. Dukkha. You could say it quite simply. You can say the dukkha exists because the pleasurable feeling is also not going to stay with you. Yeah. It's but also going to disappear. Right. But the two are there. Yes. They are, they are in a relative uh, reality. They exist, certainly. In the ultimate reality... None of that is. In the, in the ultimate reality, then none of this is of any consequence. But they certainly exist, yes. But the dukkha is seen because the pleasurable feeling can also not remain with you. Mm-hmm. Everything that's pleasurable disappears. Everything that's dukkha, well, well, that's painful, we're quite happy when that disappears. But the pleasure also disappears. So ultimately, you can't find complete fulfillment. And most people, I mean, I would say, no, just most, everybody who looks for a spiritual path are aware of that, whether they are consciously or subconsciously aware of it. They are aware of the fact that they haven't found the things in the world that will give them ultimate satisfaction. Now, sometimes these people think it's their own stupidity that they haven't found it. And sometimes they think it's the stupidity of their parents that they haven't found it. And sometimes they think it's the nastiness of their partners that they haven't found it. (laughs) But in reality, what it really boils down to is that they have seen it can't be found. And so whatever they think, it doesn't matter. At least they come to the spiritual path. You know, even if they think that it's somebody else that hasn't done the right thing. And that just can't be found there. And even in the nicest thing, there's always this... There's some other dukkha in it also. I have mentioned that once, but I mention it now because it fits in here very well. Not only that the pleasurable feeling also disappears, but because we haven't yet seen this disenchantment, we are keen on keeping it. We're trying to hang on to it. And that in itself is already dukkha. Because we're trying to get something, hang on to this, which we can't actually do. And so we're already in a bind. We've got already pressure already pressure upon us, putting pressure upon ourselves, that we want to keep this feeling. 
and then we see that it's not there anymore, so immediately we put pressure on ourselves to get it again. So, if that isn't dukkha, I don't know what else is. Plenty of dukkha, all the time. So dukkha certainly in this context no longer means suffering. I mean, it is, means that too, but it doesn't mean that in, a, in the um, investigation into uh, uh, reality, into absolute reality. It doesn't mean that. Anything else? Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Imagine that you have a beautiful, soft, white blanket wrapped all around you, keeping you warm, protected, safe and cared for. Feel that within yourself. How you yourself can bring about these feelings and now give this beautiful blanket as a gift to the person sitting next to you. Wrap him or her in the beautiful white soft blanket, making that person feel safe and protected, loved and cared for. Make the blanket large enough to wrap everybody in it who is present here, giving everyone the sense of safety, security, protection, love and care, feeling warm and snug and softly touched by your beautiful white blanket. Now think of your parents, whether they're still alive or not. 
and give them the gift of the beautiful white soft blanket wrap them in it cover them with your care your protection your love Think of those people who are closest to you. Give them the gift of the beautiful white blanket with which you can show them your love and your care, your protection, making them feel safe and at ease. And now let the beautiful white soft blanket wrap around all your friends, letting them experience your care, your love, making them feel safe and protected at ease. And now make the beautiful blanket large enough to wrap around all the people whom you meet in your daily lives. Giving each of them your love, your care. The feeling of being safe. Think of anyone whom you find difficult and give that person the gift of the beautiful soft white blanket too, giving warmth and care, wrapping it around that person to show your love.
think of all the people who are present in this place. Make the beautiful white soft blanket large enough to embrace all of them with it. Bringing them warmth, protection, care and love. Letting them feel your friendship. Think of all the people whose lives are far more difficult than ours. In hospital, in prison, in refugee camps, crippled, blind, hungry, without friends or shelter. Multiply the beautiful white soft blanket as many times as you can to give to each of these people as many as you can think and conjure up, wrapping each one in the softness and warmth and care and love. making them feel at ease. Now wrap the beautiful soft white blanket around yourself again. Feeling contented. About having given your love to others. Feeling warm and protected loved and cared for.
may all beings protect each other. <laughs>